Welcome back to Fall on the Field here at the Rogue River Preserve. My name is Brenda and I am one of your instructors today. In our last video, we thought about ways in which our lives are connected to salmon. We all know that there are lots of changes going on in our world right now, and salmon are no strangers to change. The life cycle of salmon is full of changes. These fish are described as anadromous because of their life cycle. Anadromous means that these fish spend their early life in fresh water, then migrate to salt water to live the majority of their lives. This is where they gain significant body mass. Then, when they have reached sexual maturity, they swim back upstream to spawn or to reproduce in the same stream where they were born. Salmon undergo many physical changes during their life cycle. When they hatch from eggs, they are called alvin and are very small. They grow into the fry stage when they are still in fresh water and venture into more open and faster waters to gain strength. The fry then grow into par, which are about six inches long and continue to swim toward the ocean. Next is the smolt phase, where the fish develop a dark back and light belly. Their internal organs, such as the gills and kidneys, also transform to be able to handle salt water. They make the journey to the ocean and may spend several years here, continuing to grow in size and strength. Finally, when salmon migrate back to freshwater, the males develop a bright red color and hook snout, which they use for fighting off competition during spawning. All of their energy is spent on migration, and they do not stop to eat during this journey. When they reach their natal streams, the salmon dig nests called reds in the gravel, where eggs are laid and fertilized. A female salmon lays thousands of eggs, but only a small percentage of the baby salmon will survive. The others become food for birds, fish, or other animals. Because of their anadromous life cycle, salmon play a huge role in nutrient cycling. During their time in the ocean, salmon absorb marine nutrients, which they carry in their bodies back to their natal waters. All salmon die after spawning, thus releasing these important nutrients into the freshwater environment. Freshwater ecosystems depend on this nutrient cycling made possible by salmon. Now there are three species of anadromous fish of the Rogue River. The Chinook salmon, the coho salmon, and the steelhead trout. First, let's talk about Chinook salmon, Oncorhynchus chewicha, also known as the king salmon because they are the largest of the Pacific salmon. They are blue-green in the ocean, and the males develop a red color and hooked snout when they return to fresh water. They reach maturity after three to eight years, and they eat other fish and are preyed on by orcas, sea lions, and sharks. The coho salmon, Oncorhynchus kisuch, is also known as the silver salmon. They have greenish bluish backs with silvery sides in the ocean and develop a reddish maroon color in fresh water. The males also develop a hook snout when returning to fresh water to spawn. They mature in four years. Like the Chinook salmon, they eat small fish and are prey to otters, seals, birds, and orcas, sharks, and sea lions. Finally, steelhead trout, Oncorhynchus mecus, are in fact rainbow trout that are anadromous. They may spawn several times before dying, unlike other salmon. They are torpedo shaped and have a brassy color to their head while in the ocean and are a pinkish red during their freshwater lives. These anadromous fish of the Rogue River are in decline due to overfishing, pollution, climate change, and habitat loss due to logging and dam construction. 
Many populations of these fish have been listed as threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act. Fish hatcheries play a unique role in the status of salmon. Fish hatcheries are facilities that breed, hatch, and raise fish artificially until they're big enough to be released into the wild habitat. On one hand, hatcheries provide a way for threatened or endangered species to reproduce successfully and increase their populations. On the other hand, fish that are reared in a hatchery have lower genetic diversity and are not as resilient to the different elements of the wild. Within hatcheries, interbreeding may take place and result in fish with weaker genetics that compromise their survivability. This raises questions about the effects of releasing these fish with lower genetic diversity into wild ecosystems. How does this impact other salmon? What happens if hatchery salmon and wild salmon reproduce together? Pause the video and write down some of your thoughts. In our next video, we are going to make our own design of a salmon that would be specialized for surviving in the ocean as well as the Rogue River. See you soon!